Hello, and welcome to your lecture on Rome's transition to empire. Grab your student notes and use them to follow along and fill in any blanks that you missed in class. During most of the 465 years of the Roman Republic, the government provided a stable structure under which Rome flourished, expanded, and prospered. However, eventually the cracks began to show. The Roman Republic began to fall apart during her later years, especially during the first century BC, as generals used their armies and popularity to seize political control. This culminated when Julius Caesar, a politician and general who lived from 100 to 44 BC, was appointed dictator for life, and the Roman Republic was effectively killed. Julius Caesar was an excellent speaker and general who followed through on his promises and supported policies that helped out the plebeians, the common folk. For example, after he became dictator, he tried to help out the poor by forgiving about one quarter of all the debt in Rome, making sure no one had to pay rent for a year, and putting in his will that after he died, he wanted his immense fortune to be split up equally between all the citizens in Rome. Successful military campaigns, especially in Gaul, which is modern day France, won Caesar the loyalty of his troops and the love of the Roman people. Caesar made sure to send home reports of every military victory and even wrote a popular book, Seven Commentaries on the Gallic War, which celebrated his triumphs. In other words, even when he was far away from Rome, Julius made sure that everyone in Rome knew exactly how awesome he was. The Roman Senate watched Julius Caesar's career with increasing apprehension. Over the past 40 years, many of which been fraught with civil war, they learned firsthand the dangers of a power-hungry general. In 49 BC, threatened by Caesar's growing power and popularity, the Senate ordered him to return home to Rome without his army. Julius Caesar had a difficult decision to make. He could obey the Senate and return alone to Rome. That would mean the end of his career and probably the end of his life. Or he could disobey the Senate. That would mean civil war. Alea iactest, Caesar said at last, the die is cast. And he crossed the Rubicon River, the northern border of Italy, with his army, knowing full well this meant civil war. War. Caesar won that war and was appointed first dictator in 49 BC and then dictator for life in 44 BC. Dictator didn't mean tyrant in the Roman Republic the way it does now. Instead, dictators were leaders chosen in times of crisis to take total control of the government for six months. There have been dictators throughout Roman history. The idea was the leader would step up take control, and then after six months or when the crisis was resolved, would step down and return power to the Roman people. Well, Caesar liked his power, and he wasn't about to step down. Making Caesar dictator for life effectively ended the Republic by giving permanent power to one person. Julius Caesar had seized total control of the Roman government. He might not have used the word king, but that's what he was to all intents and purposes, and he wasn't shy about letting people know it. But not everyone was willing to let the Republic go gentle into that good night. The day before the middle of the month in the Roman calendar is known as the Ides. And on the Ides of March, that is the 15th of March, 44 BC, Julius Caesar was assassinated by 60 senators who believed that killing him was necessary to restore the Republic. Even the murder of Julius Caesar could not restore the Republic, however. Rome's next ruler would be Augustus Caesar, who lived from 63 BC to 1480. He was not a dictator. Instead, he was Rome's first emperor. Before Augustus was Augustus, he was Octavian, the nephew and heir of Julius Caesar. He was a brilliant political strategist with a tight control over his emotions and a talent for propaganda. Octavian was 18 years old when his great uncle Julius Caesar was assassinated. He headed straight for Rome and between 44 and 27 BC gained power by first allying with Lepidus and Mark Antony, two of the most powerful men in Rome, and then turning against them. Lepidus, who was high priest, was a lesser threat. Octavian had him put under house arrest for the rest of his life and was even considerate enough to wait until Lepidus died before taking Lepidus's title of high priest for himself. Mark Antony 
was a bigger fish to fry, but Octavian was not dismayed. He waged such an effective propaganda war against Antony that Rome agreed to fight Antony as if he were a foreign enemy instead of a Roman citizen. Needless to say, Octavian won and Mark Antony committed suicide. Octavian returned to Rome covered in glory, and everyone in Rome waited with bated breath to see what he would do next. But Octavian had learned from the example of his uncle, and he knew what dangers awaited him if he tried to become dictator for life. So he decided a power grab of a different style, and in the end, he seized power by giving it away. In the year 27 BC, Octavian announced that all of Rome's enemies had been defeated. Rome was at peace, and so he, Octavian, could now give up his wartime powers. Like the great dictators of old, he was restoring power to the people. But the people didn't want Octavian to step down. They loved him. Octavian knew that. In fact, he was counting on it. And the Senate knew it too. Fearing that the people would riot if he stepped down, the Senate kept Octavian in charge, but not under the title of dictator. Instead, they renamed him Augustus, which means august, inspiring reverence and admiration. And here, in this prime piece of propaganda, you see Octavian as Augustus, his hand lifted to give an order, his breastplate carved with his military victories, his feet bare as the feet of the statues of mythical heroes in Rome were left bare. To his side is Eros, also known as Cupid, the son of the goddess of love, Venus, to whom Augustus also claimed he was related. Talk about an Augustly. Perhaps Augustus Caesar's greatest legacy was the Pax Romana, or the Roman peace. 200 years of relative peace and stability within a war-weary empire. This peace was hard won. Augustus Caesar worked hard to reform laws, records, and the army in order to ensure that civil war would not tear the empire apart again. Not one to let an accomplishment go by unnoticed. Augustus built the Ara Pacis Augusti, the altar of Augustan peace, an altar dedicated to the Roman values of peace, harmony, duty, decency, and wealth. And lest anyone forget who it was that had brought Rome that peace, harmony, duty, decency, and wealth, Augustus had built near the altar a giant sundial. A sundial is a type of clock that tells time by the shadows cast upon it. And every year on Augustus's birthday, the shadow cast by this sundial would point straight to the altar of Augustan peace. Octavian ruled for over 40 years from 27 BC to his death of natural causes in 14 AD. His good laws and governance kept the people happy, and the respect he showed for the Senate kept them happy because it let them pretend like they were still in charge. This play acting became the norm in the empire, the Senate pretending that they still had control, the emperor holding all the real power. The Republic was dead, but no one wanted to acknowledge it. See you next week.